Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we ask that you silence all electronic devices. Our program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to PAX Capital Conference, PAX 2021 Capital Conference. Now, please welcome in person PAX President and CEO, Mr. Dean Miller. All right, how was the morning? Fun to be back? Fun to be back? Come on. There were some tremendous pitches, um, and uh, the Lion's Den Committee is watching, so uh, much more work to be done. Uh, we are, again, so excited and grateful to be back in person, uh, to be helping making connections between the 45-plus entrepreneurs that are here and the over 100 investors uh, that uh, came out from all over, not just Philadelphia, but literally all over the country and East Coast. And um, again, if you're not familiar, our work is certainly not done here. From a PAC perspective, you know, we really focus on the guideposts of equity and access. Um, we look to identify underrepresented founders in the tech, healthcare, and fast-growing spaces entrepreneurially. And uh, we're excited to showcase so many different types of companies uh, here today. Uh, We've got a great afternoon, so stay tuned for some great additional company pitches and, of course, ending with uh, a special lion's den. Um, I also want to point out that we started a mentor program, uh, for those that you don't know, called Mentor Connect about seven years ago. And it has actually taken off right through COVID. And here today, we have our largest representation of both mentors and mentees. Mentees that are pitching their companies, mentors that have been supporting them, many that have met for the first time. And I just really want to give them a round of applause for all that they're doing. Please join me. If you want to get involved as a mentee, you're looking for an advice, it is a team-based mentorship program. Um, or as a mentor, please see one of uh, the PAC team members out at the front desk. And on that note, I just want to uh, 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 follow Pam's comments and thankful comments for the team. Uh, the PAC team has really done an incredibly tireless job, led by the conference director, Cheryl Jarvis Johnson. Please, a round of applause for Cheryl. And the whole team, uh, Kim, Di, Chris, Heidi, Megan, uh, Jen, it just, uh, again, an amazing team that I get the privilege to working with uh, in doing all that we do. So with that, we've got an interesting conversation for you here today. But first, a man who really needs no inter introduction. Andy Cherry is a PAC board member. He's a partner at KPMG. And for many of you who have been to this conference before, uh, he not only sponsors this lunch, so you can thank him for that, uh, but he puts an incredible amount of time and energy into the introductions of our speakers. And so with that, I would love to introduce Andy Cherry. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Dean said, I'm Andy Cherry from KPMG, and on behalf of our entire emerging growth practice, I'd also like to welcome you. To kick off, I just want to say how thrilled I am that we're having an in-person conference this year. So I'd like to give a tremendous amount of credit to Dean and the entire PAC staff, as well as to Neil, John, Roger, Pamela, and their partners at RCCB for organizing this live event and for really having the guts to bring us all together today. Over the years, our keynote lunch address has been made by a figure from the sports, media, and entertainment world. This year, we're excited again to have two people who bring a wealth of sports media broadcasting credentials. Tracy Wolfson is a four-time Emmy Award-nominated reporter for CBS Sports. She was named the lead game reporter for the NFL on CBS in May of 2014, and currently teams with Jim Nance and Tony Romo on CBS's top National Football League game each week. 
Tracy was on the sideline as lead reporter for Super Bowls 50 and 53, and also serves as the lead reporter for the network's coverage of the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Championship. Tracy's also a host on We Need to Talk, the first ever nationally televised all-female weekly sports show, which airs on the CBS Sports Network. Tracy's a multi-talented reporter who's been involved with coverage of the U.S. Open Tennis Championships, auto racing, skiing, snowboarding, ice skating, gymnastics, track and field, and rodeo for the network. Prior to joining CBS, Tracy was an anchor reporter for the Madison Square Garden Network and worked for ESPN covering U.S. Open golf, college football, and arena football. Tracy grew up in Congress, New York, and graduated with a communications degree from the University of Michigan. Tracy currently resides in New Jersey with her husband and three sons. Mark Zumoff can be described as one of the all-time legendary broadcasters in Philadelphia sports history. Mark Zumoff, Harry Callis, Merrill Reese, Gene Hart. This past June, Mark retired as the television voice of the Philadelphia 76ers, a position he held for 27 seasons and which was the job he dreamed of since he was a youngster growing up in Northeast Philadelphia. Mark's retirement capped a 39-year run covering the team and 44 years in broadcasting games. Mark's also provided play-by-play -play for the U.S. women's basketball team at the Rio Olympics, as well as for Turner Sports and NBA TV. Mark's professional accolades include winning the Mid-Atlantic Region's Emmy Award for Best Play-by-Play -play Announcer 19 times, being voted Pennsylvania Sportscaster of the Year in 2018 and 2019, and receiving the Bill Campbell Award from the Philadelphia Sports Writers Association in 2018. He's also a member of the Temple University School of Media and Communications Hall of Fame and the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Mark's also been very active in retirement. He currently serves as the Associate Director of the Claire Smith Sports Media Center at his alma mater, Temple University, where he also teaches a class in the art of play-by-play. -play. Mark's also working with Maccabee USA as the chairman of Maccabee Media, a program which sends more than a dozen aspiring sports media professionals to cover the Maccabee Games in Israel. Mark's been married to Debbie for 38 years and plans to spend much more time with her and their two sons as he sets sail into the next phase of his life. Please join me in welcoming Tracy Wolfson and Mark Zumoff. Thank you. Well done. Tracy, look, we're live. I don't do live. I don't do live. No, you do. That's <laughs> just it. I'm just kidding. I mean, that's what we've done, right? I All know. these years speaking live on TV. What's it like to be live on TV? It's great. You know, you never really know what's going to happen. You never know what you're going to say. Uh, no, you know, I've been live on TV for 17 years now with CBS. Um, I actually started in Trenton, New Jersey, though, at a mom and pop shop called WZBN. And I worked there for a year to- Wait a second, tell everybody how you got that job. All right, I, uh, I put together a fake tape. I had nothing coming out of college. I went to the University of Michigan. I knew I wanted to do this, like Mark, since I was eight years old. And uh, I had no idea how to get there. So I went to the University of Michigan, their journalism program closed down, and I'm like, what now? How am I, am I gonna get on the air with no tape? I actually graduated still with no tape. I went to work at CBS as a researcher. Then I was an agent for a year. Then I was a sports production assistant. Then I worked as a producer at News 12 Long Island. And I'm like, how am I gonna get on the air? And while I was at News 12 Long Island, I would follow a young reporter around every time he did his reports, I did them on the side. Nothing ever aired, but I would just walk along with him. And, I, and that's how I started putting together my tape. And I was like, okay, I got enough stuff. Nothing ever you know, was on TV live. Nothing was ever on. And I sent it all across the country and I got my first job in Trenton, New Jersey, 
for this mom and pop shop. The only sports reporter hired there, it was three of us, an anchor, a news reporter, and a sports reporter. And, but it was the break I needed. It was the break to really have the opportunity to cover stuff, to, to learn how to edit and do graphics and put a real tape together and get experience on the air. So the key about that, speaking of live though, is I was there for a year um, before I fortunately got a job at MSG Network and ESPN. I had never been live though. We did all Monday through Friday, no live, just taped stuff and the broadcast would happen later on that evening. So I got hired by MSG and ESPN to do live. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. So the first game I did live was for ESPN. I did a Kentucky Louisville college football game and I'm like, oh my God, and here I am screaming into the microphone, not realizing that the microphone, there's a reason you use a microphone, you don't have to scream. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got my first start into live television. But what I love is Mark and I had similar paths. It's very rare that, and for a lot of you out here, I'm sure that's the case, that you grow up knowing exactly what you want to do. And people ask me, you know, when did you know? I knew when I was eight years old. I was sitting in my room, I was watching the NBA Inside Stuff with Willow Bay and Ahmad Rashad, and I said, I want to be her. I want to talk sports for the rest of my life. And Mark, you had a similar path. I did. So when I was younger, I'm a little bit older than you, but when I was younger, if we have any 50 or 60 somethings in here, do you remember the old top 40 DJs? <laughs> WFIL radio, this is George Michael. Hey, we got the association. And as soon as he stopped talking, you would hear, cherish is the word I use. <laughs> like the lyrics would come in. I was fascinated by that. So I had a record player at home and I would replicate being a DJ. Meantime, my father took me to a Sixers game. The first year the team had moved from Syracuse, I fell in love with the whole thing. And I started turning the sound down to the TV and doing games into a tape recorder. And back in the day, there was no ESPN. There was no cable, there was no satellite, there was no streaming, nothing. We had basically three TV channels and some UHF stations, and every once in a while there'd be a Sixers game on. But I wanted to practice my craft more. So what I did was I would come home from school, and I live in Philly, so we had channels three, six, and 10, and I would put the TV on channel eight. So you might ask yourself, why am I putting the TV on channel eight? Well, channel eight was what? It was snow, and the sound of static in my warped, 14-year-old mind to me sounded like a crowd. <laughs> so I used to sit there and I used to literally make up games. Chamberlain to Greer, Greer back to Chamberlain, hook shot in the game, good! <laughs> and there I would turn up the sound and I would have myself a crowd. And it's funny too because when I listen to myself sometimes on the air, tape of a game, I hear myself saying things in a way than I did when I was eight years old, which is really funny. You are, of course, unlike me, you're a woman. <laughs> and in sports media now, I think women are making some dramatic inroads. In fact, I was replaced by a woman, Kate Scott, who I think is gonna do a terrific job. What's it like now being a woman in sports media as opposed to, say, 20 years ago when you first broke in? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult. I'm actually gonna go back to even further than 20 years ago when I was a researcher at CBS and I wanted to take the next step. And while I wanted to be in front of the camera, um, like I said, I had no tape. So I was at CBS and I was like, okay, I'll just get promoted to the next job, which is, they call it a broadcast associate. And you work in the trucks and you do graphics and stuff. So I went in for the interview and I was really confident I would get the job and I, remember telling my boss, like, this is what I want to do. I want to take that next step. I really want it. I love it here. He's like, I know you know sports, and I know you love sports, but not like the guys do. Yeah, that was my reaction, too. Like, my jaw dropped, and I was like, did he really just say that? Like, did that happen? And I will tell you, it was kind of the kick in the butt I needed, because I was like, well, I'm out of here, right? And I left, and I actually pursued pursued the dream that I wanted to, because probably if I hadn't left there, I would have just gone up the ladder to BA and AD and producer or director. 
Um, so that was happening back then. And even maybe further back, when I talked about Willow Bay, she was really one of the few women out there that I was able to really watch and learn from and model myself after. Uh, there was no cable network for me. And it was really hard to learn from a female and know kind of, and, and just have role models. So I didn't really grow up with a role model that I was able to kind of feed off of and get advice from and say, how do I manage and navigate all of this? So I really did a lot of that on my own until I, I joined CBS and Leslie Visser uh, became a, a huge role model and a huge help to me. But it is completely different. There were you know, a handful of women back then, and now every time you turn on the TV, you see women covering sports. Uh, I've been very fortunate in this journey, though, where I haven't had a lot of those aha moments. And we talked a little bit about this, and I think there is something that I always tell young female reporters out there is just know your stuff. Just go about your business and know your stuff, because if you do that, no one can kind of criticize you. No one can look at you differently. Yes, you're going to be judged a lot of times by your look and your voice, and very differently than maybe men are judged in this business. But if you know your stuff and you go out there and you present it just as well, well, you're gonna have longevity in this business. And there's a lot of factors that go into it. It makes it difficult, but if you're on the field and you're talking, be professional, don't draw attention. I never like to draw attention to the fact that I'm a woman in this business. I like to use it to raise our platform and to make change and to see more women coming into this business, which I do like to do behind the scenes. But I'm always, just say focus. Put your blinders on and just do your job. So I wanted to pick up on something you just said about someone questioning your knowledge of sports. I just finished the second edition of a sports casting textbook. And I did a whole chapter on women and diversity in sports media. There was a woman in the 60s. Her name was Jeannie Morris. She married a football player for the Chicago Bears, Johnny Morris. And when he retired, she wanted to start her career in sports journalism. So she happened to get a job with the Chicago American. They said, okay, you could do a column once a week on football. So she did this column, but instead of putting her in the sports section, they put her in the women's section. And then they sent her out to cover some Bears games. And one afternoon, she was at Soldier Field, and it was a blizzard. And not only when they let her sit in the press box, she had to sit on the roof of the press box in a blizzard and cover this game. So just gives you an indication, some perspective here on yes, women still have a ways to go. People of color still have a ways to go, but my goodness, how far we have come from back in the day. I did wanna mention uh, one thing as we kind of bounce around to topics here. Uh, we all have one of these. And I think this, combined with the internet, has created a real wild west in terms of sports media. Never before has one single person had power both ways. They can make themselves a star with this, and they could take in almost any amount of knowledge, viewing, sports information, whatever, through this. This has essentially replaced your TV, your radio, and your newspaper. Has anyone here ever heard of Corey Cotton from Dude Perfect? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, so Corey Cotton and his brother were students at Texas A&M. And they were in their backyard one day with a bunch of friends and they decided, and they, they were practicing trick shots and they decided, all right, you know what? Let's do some trick shots. We'll record them on the iPhone and we'll put them on the internet just for laughs. They did this, and about a month or so later, they were getting tens of thousands of views. So this dude perfect, and the name comes from, hey, you made, made, the, made the trick shot? Oh, dude, perfect. <laughs> so they named their entity Dude Perfect. They are now the second most watched streaming channel on YouTube behind WWE. They have a regular tour they have merchandise, and they are a going concern every bit as big and every bit as important as NBC Sports Philadelphia. And they are my kids' favorite show. 
Right. There you so go. That's all they're right. watching, and they're trying to replicate every trick shot that they're doing. Not successfully, I must say. But you, that, you bring up a really good point. How much do you use the internet, Twitter, social media, when it comes to preparing for a game? A ton. I have a process of about five or six hours where I have an Excel spreadsheet, and the internet is almost exclusively it. The big question is, because there's so much nonsense out there, and I know you can relate to this, is what can you trust? Right. What is a reliable source of information? And after a while, using the internet, you become accustomed to the reliable sites, whether it's a team website, a league website, uh, you know, ESPN or CBS, you know that there is some reliability there. And if you're in doubt, of course, you go to the PR person for the team and you, you, uh, you, know, you question the viability of it and get their confirmation. But almost exclusively, I mean, and, and now it's to the point where, and this dovetails into another thing I wanted to talk about is NBC Sports Philadelphia and regional sports networks in general, how their base of support is eroding. You've heard the term cord cutters. So your children, and my kids are a little bit older, but they are now growing up in a world where linear TV, meaning ABC or CBS or Channel 6 or whatever you want to call it, doesn't mean anything to them. It's just another information source. And so because of that, you have sports fans who are now doing what we call cord cutting, which is they don't want to pay 150 or 200 bucks a month for cable. And they love the Sixers, or they love the Phillies, or they love the Flyers, but not enough to pay 150 bucks a month. So they will cut the cord, they will subscribe to Comcast for the internet, so they get all of that, and they will basically stop watching the games on NBC Sports Philadelphia. Maybe if they come on NBA TV or ABC or ESPN, they'll watch them there. Other than that, they are cutting the cord. So because of all this cord cutting now, you have the regional sports networks, and they're going to be forced to come up with another model at some point, which will probably be what they call direct-to-consumer. Whereas those of you who love the Phillies, or you love the Flyers, or you love the Sixers, or you love all three, you will pay X amount for that. And NBC Sports Philadelphia, maybe one day, it will be totally different or be a thing of the past. Well, we just did that. We just cut the cord in my house because that's- You did. Th that's exactly right. But we went to YouTube TV where you can get a CBS and an ABC because we watch football, NFL. We want to make sure that we can get every game. We want to be able to watch two games at, at the same time. So we can't get rid of the networks. And it brings up a good point. I think what you're going to wind up happening, which is what we have, is you have an app for this and an app for this. And you have Netflix and you have Apple TV and you have everything. You have the Yes Network or you know, NBC Sports Philadelphia. And you, you're able to pick and choose what you want. But I don't think that the networks are going away. There is this linear uh, viewing which you still need. Now, the whole point of cutting the cord, it's the millennials that they don't need cable. They don't need um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of channels. So yes, you have to gear yourself towards them and find other ways that they will continue to consume and watch. And this is where it's all going. But you can't forget about those that are still watching, that like to sit on their couch with a flipper in their hand and click, click, click throughout the networks. I know my husband still likes to do that. Mm -hmm. He leans mm -hmm. back. Now we're doing it through YouTube TV. But there is that whole population, and they don't want to get, the networks don't want to get rid of that. No one wants to get rid of that population. There are huge viewing population out there. So I don't think that linear television is going away anytime soon. I don't think the networks feel it. And I don't think the leagues feel it either. So you have NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA's rights are coming up soon. Yes, all of these different streaming sources will come into play. Amazon is now doing Thursday night football. The NBA is getting calls for, and we'll be talking about this, from you know, gambling giants, right? From sports books to potentially get in on these right fees. You have Facebook that's going to be um, viewing the Euro League. Whatever it might be, yes, there will be those streaming partners for those fans that don't have network television or you know, linear TV. But for the most part, these leagues want to stick with it because they, have to, they can't alienate a section of the population. So you just mentioned rights fees. That's one of the things that is driving 
this new economic model for regional sports networks and why cord cutting is such a problem because what you have is you have leagues and you have teams and they're not lowering their rights fees anytime soon. They're at an all time high, sports is a very popular product. So you have escalating rights fees and on the other hand you have people cutting the cords so your income is diminished. I think the thing about rights fees is the fact that um, there is no end in sight right now and that uh, whether it's a team or a league, they need the income. That's why gambling, and we could talk a little bit about gambling, that's why it's been embraced now by the leagues and the teams. And I think a lot of that started back in 2014. And I think the NBA, by the way, is a very progressive league, but it happened to be Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, who wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. This was in 2014. And he said, in effect, it's about time that we bring gambling out of the closet. And part of that is a league saying, you know what, this stuff is going on anyway. It's not unlike the legalization of cannabis now, where they're saying, let's regulate it, let's make money off of it, and let's take advantage of the fact that there are you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars out there for that. And so you've gone from the leagues shunning gambling to hey, we could be partners and we could each make a lot of money. And I'll tell you what, right now it's the Wild West. As a retired guy, for example, my agent is fielding calls from these gaming services. We would love to be able to sign Mark to a deal where if he tweets out something that we want out there, we'll pay him 500 bucks a tweet or something like that. I mean, that's what take it's it, become in terms deal. of gambling. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Do I have to give you a commission please, though? Please. I, I agree with you. I think that gambling is, you know, it's all about fan engagement, right? I think that's what all these, you know, leagues and sports are trying to figure out. How do you engage the fans more? And they have to, gambling is a big way to do that. And it need, you know, both the leagues, both the networks need to start engaging in that and embracing it because that is the sign of the times. That's where it's going. Again, it's a, a new generation. How do you make sure you incorporate everyone? I do think it's interesting. The NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, they are embracing it. There's a certain amount of commercials now, as you see, on ad space that you have to put out there. Um, there are rules to it. CBS is actually one of those networks that hasn't really embraced it. There's no one-off shows. ESPN, you'll see. You can click over to ESPN2 or Plus or go online and there's gambling shows. Um, everyone's doing something different, but they're trying to manage this space. It's ever changing. I think I spoke to an executive of Major League Baseball and the one thing they did say to me is, you know, we have to remember that this is still a family sport. So it is out, Major League Baseball needs to make sure that they're not going too much over there because there are still, you know, kids and family and you wanna keep that going. So they have to find that fine line and it's maybe finding those different ways to stream or different sites to embrace the gambling. And it's a perfect example of another thing we wanna talk about is NFTs. We talk about these player engage fan engagement. How else are you going to engage these fans? Well, these NFTs are really the next newest way for sports to, and it's not only sports, it's happening in, in the art world and everywhere, but for sports to certainly make revenue, right? But to also increase fan engagement. So does anybody know what an NFT is? Raise your hands. Okay. But does anyone understand Yeah, right. What it is? <laughs> or cryptocurrency for that matter. So non-fungible token. So fungible meaning it's something that could be replaced. So non-fungible token is something that makes it unique. And the best example that I can come up with is, I thought about this on the way in today, Michael Jordan, his play where it was game, I wanna say game six, it was the 98 finals, where he appears to sort of push away uh, Byron Russell, the Utah Jazz, and makes a, makes a shot and gives uh, the Bulls their sixth title. You can now own that. Now you say to yourself, well, you know, it's on, it's on YouTube. I, I see it all the time. I can, uh, I can access that anytime. What does it mean that I own it? Well, what it is is the NBA, probably through a third party, you can purchase this from the third party. And the way that you own it is there is some sort of a unique code that's put on this to indicate that you own this piece. So, you know, and on one hand, you might say to yourself, well, you know, it's not a tangible thing. It's not like a ticket. 
It's not a Hannes Wagner you know, baseball car, which is one of the most expensive and valuable items in the memorabilia world. This is, this is an electronic highlight. But as long as you have people who perceive it to have a value, it has a value. And so go ahead. No, but I wanted to follow up on that because you mentioned the baseball card. Well, that's a perfect example. It's, it's how do you, you're, you're making revenue, you're engaging fans, but we're, we're talking about this next generation that don't take a, a baseball card and put it into an album anymore. Although, or don't even see like paper tickets anymore. Right, which my kids, by the way, are obsessed still with collecting football and basketball and baseball cards, and they actually do have albums for it, but that's not the wave of the future. And we all know that, it's all digital. And so it's by, I just actually went on NBA Top Shot, where you can buy these digital packs of about 25 to 30 plays in the NBA. Plays by a player, and you open up your pack and you say, I got that Michael Jordan shot. And then you trade it, and you have it, and you keep it, and it's a collectible, and it's a way to, whether you want to save it for posterity reasons, or whether you want to, you, it's going to make money in the future, just like baseball cards are, which is really brilliant, actually, if you think about it, because that's kind of where everything's going. You're not, you know, taking your big binder and carrying it around and throwing, you know, your cards on the floor. Now you, you have your phone it. or an electronic right, wallet you're swapping, where you can show you're doing, And the same thing for ticket stubs, right? We all collected ticket stubs or playbills or when we went to a show. Now it's all going to be digital, and it's just about it, swapping it. It's a way of collectibles collecting it, sports memorabilia, it's gonna take it to a whole new world. Now, I do believe there's parts of it that are just gonna be a fad and that are gonna go away. Like, they say that you can make money off of a call or an interview. Let's say my interview with Peyton Manning at Super Bowl 50, which is, was his final interview. They can say to me, okay, well, we wanna give you X and this, you know, someone wants to buy the rights to it. Like you said, you can just go on YouTube and you can watch that interview anytime you want. I don't believe that's where the future of NFTs is. There's that happy medium, but it's brilliant. Yeah, and there's also a concept uh, called unlockables. Anybody familiar with unlockables, what an unlockable is? So that's an accompanying feature of the NFT. So in other words, it's kind of like, um, you know, you, you buy an item, but you also get, say, a, a here, here's an example, and this is something that I, another thing I don't, I don't mind telling you, I'm, I'm trying to cook up with uh, my business manager, is I have turning garbage into gold trademark. It's one of the zooisms that obviously I came up with, and we've sold t-shirts and we've benefited a local charity with those sales, but what he is suggesting is I record that and then sell it as an NFT. <laughs> and, but there also has to be an accompanying unlockable, which would probably mean, you know, an autographed sweatshirt from me or something like that. But, you know, it's even trickled down to poor schleps like me where, you know, the NFT market is kind of uh, open, which I yeah. find really interesting. I do. And, and I think alongside we were talking fan engagement, something else that's really big in sports right now is all this player empowerment. And these are perfect ways, you know, whether you have, you know, Patrick Mahomes creating his own art and, you know, making an NFT of it and then, you know, making money off of it. Now we know these, these athletes make a, a large amount of money. That's not, not you know, really what we're worried about. But I think player empowerment is a huge part in sports right now. And you're seeing it from top to bottom. And now you are right in the mix of that, or you were right in the mix with Ben Simmons. Mm -hmm. And his, you know, Do we have point. to talk about Ben Simmons? <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. But it's a perfect example, right? There are players now who feel the need to say, I don't want to be here. I want to go where I want to go. I want to win a championship here. I want to do that. And they have, whether they have the right, whether a fan believes they have the right or not to do that, it is becoming more and more this opportunity of independence to say, I want to demand a trade and be able to go where I want and play where I want. And I think that's I mean, you really, you've seen it grow. How much has player empowerment, especially in the NBA and the NFL, grown over the years? Well, to the point where a couple of years ago when they were playing in the bubble, this was shortly after the George Floyd shooting, obviously the vast majority of players in our league are people of color, and they were so upset by what was happening, and this was playoff time in the middle of the summer, that the Milwaukee Bucks decided they were not gonna take the floor. 
And what ended up happening was uh, the league more than ever embraced um, uh, sayings on the floor, messages on uniforms, that sort of thing. So there are some who think, well, that's beginning to erode some of the audience now. And I've had people come up to me personally. And again, I'm not going to get into a discussion of the Black Lives Matter movement and is it right and all that. But I've had people come up to me and say, um, I don't want politics mixed with my sports. And I think the NBA has seen a mild erosion in their viewership and, and some of their ticket sales because of this. So at some point, the water's got to reach a certain level where the decision is made um, keeping their fan base and maintaining that vis-a-vis -vis, um, essentially keeping, their, I don't want to say keeping their employees happy, but letting their employees know that they are behind them in this political messaging. Uh, you, you talk about Ben Simmons and player empowerment. There are some people right now who think that he might be hiding behind mental health as a way to continue to get paid. That, is, that in my opinion, is a slippery slope. I am one of those who actually, while uh, the commentators, whether it's Stephen A. Smith or Shaquille O'Neal, uh, as soon as the Sixers were eliminated from the playoffs and Ben Simmons had passed up that open dunk, were killing Ben Simmons for it, I was saying, yes, uh, you have a right to be unhappy with a guy passing up an open dunk with two minutes to go in a critical game seven, but I think he's got some mental health issues. And that was really confirmed for me when he went on and did the post-game interview in a mask, where players by that time, especially when they were isolated by themselves, you know, doing the media remotely, had done away with masks pretty much uh, as a whole. So the Ben Simmons situation right now is a really sticky one. I know I'm now I'm addressing it, but I know everybody's <laughs> interested in it. And um, navigating that is going to be very difficult as it relates to his mental health. And, and, I, and I did say this after the Sixers were eliminated, that people lionized Joel Embiid because he played with a sore knee and played very well, as a matter of fact. But Ben Simmons, because he passed up a dunk because he's got mental health issues, they killed him for that. And I do think the Ben Simmons situation notwithstanding, that mental health needs a, uh, a better reception, and I think that mental health needs to be addressed every bit the way that a sore knee or a sore ankle is. And, and you're right, and it ha I think it's coming, and I think it's getting there, and I think from the NFL perspective, I'm seeing it in the NFL, and they're putting out PSAs, and they're addressing it, and there are several NFL players, uh, Calvin Ridley just one, who just said, you know, I need to step back, and I need to take some time and to myself and address the mental health. And I think it, you're right, it's really important. It's important for the leagues to address it, to embrace it again. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that goes back to this player empowerment, to feel comfortable to, to come out, to say you're dealing with something. And I think that just also shows that you're human, right? And allows those fans, and that again, it, it's kind of that fan engagement, so to say, is that, while these are players making millions and millions of dollars, they are role models and they are there to set examples and kids and, and really anyone can look up to them and, and hold them on a pedestal and, and that's why there needs to be kind of that conversation constantly. And I think it is going in a, in a good, it's moving towards a good place. Um, I, I think the NFL understands that I want to flip to the NCAA because we talk a little player empowerment and they did something this summer with name, image, and likeness that was huge. And everyone has different opinions on it. Personally, my opinion is I never really thought the players should be paid per se because, or collegiate players for that. They receive a scholarship, they get a lot of you know, money towards their food and their textbooks and be able, you know, I, I've seen them, I've been in these cafeterias, I've seen them on the road in these hotels, like, I get it. And it's really difficult to pay a player from top to bottom, whether it's, you know, the number one player at the University of Michigan to, you know, the bench player on the women's team in, at the University of Connecticut. It doesn't matter. If you're going to pay one, you got to pay them all. This, to me, is a, is a really good example of allowing these collegiate athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness. They are making these colleges, these universities, so much money, as we know. What it also does is maybe it keeps them in school a little bit. And for me, 
that's, all, that's what I'm about. How, how can we keep these collegiate players in school a little longer so they're not jumping boat ship early in order to make some extra money in these, in these leagues? I think that's one. I think it really gives them an opportunity to learn the business side. We're here, basically, with 45 entrepreneurs out here pitching you know, ideas. Well, these athletes, these student athletes, are learning the world by trying to do their marketing, honing their marketing skills and making deals and you know, finding different ways that they can make money, whether it's representing a local subway, whether it's doing a podcast, whether it's selling shirts with a, a name on it, a logo on it. So for me, what if their career doesn't work out? Or what if they decide not to you know, pursue a professional um, sports league? Well, they're set up a little, a little bit better. Now, there's certain, like, there's certain cons or issues. Every state is different right now. Every college and university certainly has different rules and laws. And, you know, I'm sure it will affect recruiting. You know, hey, you come to Michigan and, you know, we can help you with this. But if you go to Arizona, we can't. You know, they can't. So I think there's a lot to it. I do think that it's headed in the right direction. And I think, you know, again, player empowerment is just, you know, another step with us going with the times. So like anything which appears to have pretty good intentions, um, and I'm going to end the uh, name image likeness discussion on this, the University of Georgia, now these weren't the individual players, but the school itself went to the football team and what they did was they made a deal with TiVo, the streaming service, so you know what Great. I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. And what they did was they uh, said, hey, if you... Uh, players, we want you to put out social media messages supporting TiVo, the streaming service, and in return for that, we're going to give you, believe it or not, TiVo-themed pajamas, <laughs> and they put like $400 on a, a like some sort of a pre yep. prepaid card, that kind of thing, but I can almost see like a school saying, well, if they're doing that, we're going to do this, and it might end up being tantamount to paying players as well, but um, I, I, I do want to change direction just a bit because, you know, now that I've gotten to know you, and of course I did a little research like I know that Tracy did on me because it's our first time appearing in public together, um, when you go to your website, the first thing that you see is an elevated shot of you interviewing Tom Brady. So I'm sure a lot of people would want me to ask you, what's it like interviewing Tom Brady? <laughs> Well, is that after a regular game or after the Super Bowl where everyone in the country was watching me trying to get Tom Brady and I wasn't able, he was like, wanted to, you know, kiss and hug everyone after the win. I'll take everyone through that a little bit from my eyes um, after that Super Bowl win where, <laughs> you know, basically your number one job is to get that post-game interview. It's actually what I relish, it's what I love. I love interviewing. And you don't get that opportunity often anymore in the NFL except post games. So, of course, I'm standing on the sideline, you know, ready, right there, and like, okay, as soon as the game ends, I am headed in there. And I kind of had this from the SC, covering the SEC for 10 years. You gotta be ready, there is no one with you, you are like, attacking that coach or player or quarterback as soon as the game ends. And oh, by the way, in the SEC, everyone storms the field. So you're navigating your way through all of that. So I had a little experience. So of course, I'm like the first person there with Tom Brady. And as I'm waiting, everyone's circling around me. And I'm trying to get the interview. And Tom and I, we've known each other for a long time. Michigan guy. We have a really good relationship. And I've covered him for a long time. And he's like, I'll be right there, you know, just, just give me time, just wait, wait a second. So I'm like holding on to him so that he doesn't like get away. And he keeps saying it to me. And it, I had no idea the whole, you know, country was actually watching. I'm thinking they're talking, they're showing pictures. Like I have no idea this was taking place. Finally, and believe it or not, there was a point where you see me duck down. And everyone's like, what happened to her? Did she get trampled? Is she okay? He actually stepped on my microphone, and my wired microphone got taken with, and I'm like, oh my God, they're going to come to me, and I'm not going to have a microphone. So we talk about teamwork, and I had a tremendous team around me where my audio guy was like, here you go, and he swapped it out for a wireless mic, and I was back in position, and then of course, finally they came to me, I did the interview, and you know, the rest, as they say, is history, but I remember walking off the field thinking nothing of it. 
Mm. To me, it was just another interview, post game. I didn't think anything went wrong. And then I got call after call after, you gotta talk to the media, Tracy, they wanna talk, I'm like, why? And then I, they all explained what was happening is that the, basically the whole country was worried that I was gonna be trampled out there. And um, it, was, it was an interesting experience. So going from, you know, Super Bowl 50 with Peyton Manning, his final game, to this, I've had some, you know, interesting post-game Super Bowl in, uh, interviews, to say the least. Speaking of wireless mics, we are told <laughs> that there is one or two out there with wireless mics to give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions. So uh, we invite any and all questions in our direction. I would say just raise your hand if you are interested, and someone will come to you with that wireless mic, and you will be able to speak with us. We got one on the back. I mean, I could be up here all day long asking you questions. Don't worry, I'm not that interested. <laughs> oh, this is long. Hi, Tracy. I just wanted to ask, when, when you do that post-game interview, it always seems like uh, you and your colleagues are so well prepared. And I just wonder, how much time do you have to think about what you're going to ask? And I, I'm just always amazed the questions are incredibly insightful, and, and it seems like you just did this on the fly. And I don't know if you researched it before, and you have kind of a cheat sheet or how you do it, but uh, I'm impressed with that. And, and Mark, just for you, we'd love to hear some of your, your, your Zoomisms before you go. What was that? I'm sorry, I missed the last just part. I just want to hear some more of your- You want more? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how appropriate they would be out of context, but. <laughs> well, I, I'll start and I'll say, you know, and Mark and I are very similar in the sense that we do a ton of research. You have to in order to be prepared for those moments because anything can happen. So our job is to really react. And I don't wanna be put in a position where I don't know what I'm about to ask, or I don't know what to say or how to react. So yes, I go into every game fully prepared of the situation. You know, if it's a win here, this is you know, the main storylines. If it's a win here, this is the main storylines. For example, I have the Brown Cincinnati this week. Uh, if the Browns win, what do you think we're gonna be talking about, right? So with, I mean, OBJ, if, if no one's look, checked Twitter lately. Um, so yes, you go in knowing, and my routine is basically, you know, react to the game. There's kind of a formula to it. React to the game, kind of what just happened, something that was a main storyline throughout, make sure you bring it back to that, and then fast forward about maybe the future. Now, I just did, you know, um, Ben Roethlisberger, and that was a big win for them. And I watched out of the corner of my, my eye as I was preparing for this interview, him talking to Miles Garrett. And that was a conversation of ours coming into the game. We talked about Miles Garrett's graveyard and how he had a tombstone of Ben Roethlisberger. I asked Ben about it, you know, earlier in the week. So I wanted to know what that, and Ben gave me a great answer about it, that the conversation that they had. So while at the same time you're preparing, you're fully prepared, you've done a lot of research for those moments, you still have to stay alert. And the number one thing, and you know this so well, is you have to listen. Listen to their answers. Because if all of a sudden they say, you know, and this happened in one of the NCAA tournament games, yeah, I was just worried because blah, blah, blah is getting X his wrist x-rayed. If I wasn't listening and I was focusing on the next question, I would have really looked dumb out there. But you got to listen, react, um, and that's the most important thing that comes with interviewing. Now, you don't do as much interviewing because you're focusing on the play-by-play. -play. How do you prepare for a game, what, is it, what goes into it, how much research do you have to do? I have an Excel spreadsheet that I designed and basically it's got different fields for player information, coach information, team information, stats, um, esoteric bio nuggets, that sort of thing. And that sheet, once it's done, serves two purposes. One, it gives me a written template that's in front of me so when and if I need to reference something specific, I can do so. But perhaps more importantly, the act of taking the information from the internet, putting it onto an Excel spreadsheet, helps to put it all up here. And so by the time the red light goes on, I have all these facts literally kind of like spinning around in my brain. And the hope is, and this is where it's key, you could prepare, and I know you're gonna nod your head yes to this, you could prepare for all these eventualities, but if you use like five to 10% of what it is that you research, it's, it's a great game. Yeah. You've used a ton because 
you end up trying to prepare for all these different eventualities, but you only use a small percentage of it. And for announcers, the key is to not um, force the facts. Start telling stories or dropping information on a player when there's no context to attach to it. That's the important thing. So you could have asked Ben Roth Roethlisberger about A, but once you saw the conversation with Miles Garrett, that had to now present itself and you had to go in that and direction. And I follow up on that, I say the same thing to young reporters out there that are like frustrated when they don't get on the air enough. And I was of course one of them, you have all this information, I come in with like 10 different stories and like you said, maybe I get one or two on because that's how the game is going. And oh, by the way, when it's a really good game, no one wants to hear from me, they wanna watch the game. I mean, that's really what it's about, let the game you know, play itself out. So I always make sure to tell everyone, it's all gonna even out in the end. You might get one story on one game and 10 stories on the next game, but we're gonna be doing this for a long time. So, you know, just, just let the game, if, if it makes sense, you slide your story in there. If not, you move on to the next one. Do you get nervous before a game? You know, I think it's that nervous anxiety, that energy of let's just get this game started. I don't get nervous for, you know, oh no, is this gonna turn out right? But you know, the only thing I prepare in my game is the open. That's the only thing I know what I'm gonna say, that I prepare for, and that I have scripted. Once that's done, it's just read and react, and the nerves kind of go away. And yes, you get a little nervous in a Super Bowl at the end when you know your post-game interview is gonna be watched by millions of people. That's just natural but it's also kind of that excitement and nervous energy. How about you? Uh, yeah, so I often equate it to, we were speaking earlier, if you're watching the Kentucky Derby, when the horse, who is a trained athlete, and the horse knows what's coming, but first, the horse has to go in this little box and be contained. And so with the horse's adrenaline going, wanting to compete, the horse can do nothing else but sit in the box until the door is open. So that's essentially, I think, what it is for me as a performer, your adrenaline starts to go, but you have no outlet for it. And then, of course, once the broadcast begins, you, uh, you do your thing and the nerves go away. I am told we have time for one more question. So to, to Tracy, what was your worst interview ever? And to Mark on Simmons, do you think he will be traded, released, or will he play for the Sixers again? I'm, I was you, fir <laughs> you first. I gotta, go, I gotta make up an answer to that one. <laughs> um, I would say, well, there's two. My hardest interview is always the loser interview I have to do after a college basketball game at the Final Four. I mean, nothing's worse than that when you gotta go ask a coach after he just lost, well, you know, how do you feel? Uh, what'd you tell the team? You know, what happened? And why didn't you call a timeout in that final minute? So um, that's the toughest interview. My worst interview actually came one of my first few years in, um, at CBS, and thank God, the internet was kind of just picking up and you can't really Google it as much anymore, um, was I was doing the US Open and that's always been one of my favorite events. I grew up a tennis player. I went with my parents every year and to get that opportunity was huge. But I was also still really green. I was still new, uh, as I had said, I was probably two years doing live television. I was interviewing Leighton Hewitt who had just beaten Taylor Dent in five sets. He was supposed to breeze through it. It was supposed to be easy three set or no problem. Well, you know, he took him to five sets and here I am right in the corner speaking of post game interviews, ready to come out of the tunnel. What am I gonna ask him? And a lot of times, as Mark knows this, you know, you wear your earpieces, you're listening to the broadcast and you're feeding off of what the broadcasters are saying. And Mary Carrillo at the time said, Oh, he really exposed his weaknesses for later in this tournament. He should have breezed through this one and it was really much tougher than, than it should have been. So I, writing down my questions and I'm like, okay. My, I go out there, I'm at Arthur Ashe Stadium. So not only is it going to, to the TV, it's going to the house. My microphone is open and I say to him, first question, you know, hey Leighton, are you concerned that, you know, this tough match exposed your weaknesses for later down in the season? And the whole entire place booed. Mm. All of Arthur Ashe Stadium booed me, okay? Mm. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, get me out of here. <laughs> and then I asked the obligatory question, right? Oh my God, congratulations. You came you know, back from down two sets to love to win it in five, how'd you do it? Like, <laughs> of course that's the question they wanted me to ask. 
So I was miserable. I walked off head down. Leighton Hewitt ripped me in the press conference. The USTA was like, what were you thinking? And I walked to my producer, and I was like this, you know, in his, in his uh, office. And he's like, you know, Tracy, it wasn't a bad question. It was just bad timing. Mm. Just remember, you're not Barbara Walters. <laughs> Quickly, I'm going to throw myself under the bus as well. My worst interview, Bob Lanier, one of the all-time greats in NBA history. He was doing work for the NBA. Live halftime interview. At the end, I said, Bob, how is it that you had such a great career and you're not a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame? And he said, I am a member of the Basketball <laughs> Hall of Fame. <laughs> and I'll answer the Ben Simmons question this way, and then we have to go. We all remember, I would think, and Andy, you were so kind mentioning Harry Callis. Harry Callis, Richie Ashburn were the great tandems in broadcasting history. They had such great chemistry. And one day, there was this weird play where a guy tried to do something, and it was totally against the baseball Bible. And Harry looked at Richie and said, Richie, why on earth did he do that? And this is an answer to your Ben Simmons question. Richie looked over to Harry and said, Harry, I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Way to get Thank you very it. much. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. It's me again, Pamela. We would like to thank Mark and Tracy for being with us today and KPMG for sponsoring this thought-provoking program. I now invite you to go back to the breakout rooms where we're, we're going to start our second session of feature company presentations. Dessert, coffee, tea, and drinks are out in the hallway. Thank you.